Australia's always had a Japanese influence in its popular media, whether it be samurai movies, karate, ninja flicks, or even JRPGs, we fucking love that shit. But today I want to talk about how Japanese animation came to be in this country. I'm going to cover everything from its inception in the 1960s for children's morning cartoons, to awareness of adult animation in the 90s, and the shift in modern marketing through to the thriving industry it is today. There is no video like this on YouTube, so sit back and let me tell you how the wonderful and wacky world of Japanese animation came to this small country in the West. During the 1960s, children's cartoons were a common sight on every household television set. Among them included Japanese animation, often in black and white, which was aimed at younger audiences with the earliest examples being shows like Astro Boy, Gigantor, Prince Planet, and Kimba the White Lion. But before we talk about the evolution of anime on TV in Australia, we must first pay respect to a show which laid the foundation for Japanese culture being a commonplace in our entertainment medium. The very first show on Australian television from Japan was On Mitsu Kenshi, more popularly known as The Samurai, which premiered in 1964 and ran for a remarkable 10 seasons with 128 episodes. The show quickly garnered a massive fan base and by 1965 was Channel 9's highest rated and most watched program, surpassing Western classics like Mickey Mouse and the Looney Tunes. It was reported that more people turned out to meet the show's star, Osei Koichi, when he arrived at Melbourne Airport than the Beatles just a year prior. And this is even more amazing, keeping in mind that this was only 20 years after the Japanese invaded Australia during World War II. More shows from Japan would make their way to Australia, being marketed as children's morning and afternoon cartoons in the late 60s and early 70s. Examples included Speed Racer, King Kong, Marine Boy, and this trend would continue well into the early 80s when a new slew of more mature science fiction content started to emerge, appealing to an older teenage generation. During the 70s, sci-fi classics like Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets were slowly shifting the age demographic for animation fans. Captain Future became one of the earliest official home media releases of Japanese animation, with a series of Betamax tapes which would later go on to be printed as VHS. The 80s saw the introduction of modern giant robots of Japan, which would greatly influence future shows like the Power Rangers becoming popular, and the Godzilla franchise garnering new fans in the West. The original Mobile Suit Gundam would have a short-lived television run, which was overshadowed by the more popular and dumbed-down version of Voltron Defenders of the Universe. The Gundam series would have to wait over a decade to reach mainstream popularity with the release of Gundam Wing in the 90s. Robotech premiered in the mid-80s, a combination of three unique anime franchises with visually similar art styles, Macross, Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, and Genesis Climber Mosbeda. The response was overwhelmingly positive and pushed a new generation of fans to seek the unique art style and storytelling that existed within Japanese animation. Although it seemed before the 90s anime had many instances of success and popularity, the actual identity of these shows being of Japanese creation was widely underknown, and the word anime outside of fantasy or comic book or other niche clubs and communities was like, if I came up to the everyday person and told them my favourite dojinshi was the type tagged as Ahegal, which may or may not be true. Regardless, one thing that unified and solidified fans' ability to discover, communicate, appreciate, and also innovate the industry, not only around the country, but around the Western world, was the dawn of the internet. In the decade of the 90s, a demand was clearly beginning for adult-themed storytelling through animation, and Japanese anime became respected as an underground medium among people in the know. In 1992, anime VHS imports began circulating from the UK with bold headlines to match their subject material. Akira among these imports was screened in back alley cinema rooms and may have been the first example of an anime film receiving a cinematic release. By 1993, imported anime had reached comic book and hobby stores around the country with titles like Project Aiko, Dominion Tank Police, 3X3 Eyes, Odin, Fist of the North Star, Venus Wars, many of which were released by Manga UK, which by then had assessed the market at the OzCon convention and would later start an Australian distribution branch. One of these titles was Legend of the Overfiend, which marketed itself on high amounts of sex, violence and gore and would later become notorious in the fan base. 
For the first time, marketed as anime for adults, shows like Akira and Hirotsuki Doji were definitely not for kids. The end of 1993 saw the release of more adult shows such as Vampire Hunter D, Heroic Legend Arslan, RG Vega, and Legend of the Demon Womb, many of these madmen would later license for their own distribution. As of August 1994, Siren became the first dedicated Australian anime distributor, announcing a partnership with Manga UK, with the debut titles being Wicked City, Cyber City Oedo, Golgo 13, Crying Freeman, Venus Wars, Tokyo Babylon, and Fist of the North Star. Siren would later go on to distribute the first Pokemon VHS in 1998, and also partner with Mad Men Entertainment for many of their earlier titles. In the same year, Kaseki started releasing anime and would later become infamous in Australia with dodgy licensing disputes and reusing other companies' tapes. One famous example including a show abruptly cutting to the 1974 Aussie Rules Football Grand Final halfway through an episode! I, I'm sorry, I just think that's hilarious. That was some shit! The following year, a show would start airing on Channel 10 that would be responsible for captivating thousands of kids around the country, bringing in a new fan base, and for many, myself included, the nostalgia and fandom of this show would last a lifetime. In July 1995, Cheese TV made its national debut on the Channel 10 network. This show would run for the next 10 years and mark the debut of several anime series that would dominate television, home media and merchandising platforms for a whole generation. Hosts Jade Gatt and Ryan Lappin became celebrities among kids with their unique and cool performances during segments when shows like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, Beyblade Card Captors, Digimon, Hamtaro, and Transformers weren't running. In 1996, Mad Men Entertainment was founded by two local anime fans who run it to this day. Originally working with Siren to distribute for Manga UK, they would later take a bold move to license and distribute their own shows independently, going on to become Australia's leading independent film and television distributor, accounting for over 90% of animation sales in Australia as of 2017. Sublicensing shows from ADV Films, Funimation, Harmony Gold, Viz Media, Bandai, Genion, Sentai Filmworks, eventually Man Man would land exclusive licensing deals from Japanese companies such as Studio Ghibli, establishing strong ties internationally and expanding into manga and graphic novel distribution. Initially distributing for North American Tokyo Pop and Singapore-based Chung Yi, their portfolio now includes Viz Media, Dark Horse Comics and Gen Press. By 2000, Kaseki had ceased operations, Siren Visual repositioned itself as a specialist licensing company, and began the acquisition of very specific titles such as Monkey Magic, The Samurai from the 1960s, and continued with anime titles such as Angel Beats, Blackrock Shooter, Chihaya Furu, Clanad, Durarara, Monster, Welcome to the NHK, and being the first company worldwide to license experimental anime Genius Party. Magna Pacific and brother company Beyond Home Entertainment picked up the rights to popular children's anime Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Zoids, Beyblade, Crush Gear, Voltron, Hamtaro, and other anime such as Shin-chan and Tokyo Underground, and have bombarded Australian retailers by releasing a million completely unnecessary new editions of the same 20 Pokemon seasons over and over again each year. Gotta collect them all, right? Unfortunately, I actually am trying to. In 2002, Spirited Away became the first widely promoted anime film to be screened in Australia, with the following years receiving a handful of drip-fed releases. Theatrical anime releases would not become a biannual occurrence until the 2010s. In 2008, Mad Men revealed Australia's first legal online streaming service known as The Screening Room, debuting with School Rumble. A limited service, this unfortunately would not see mainstream success. In 2009, the Transformers movie was released on Blu-ray by Mad Men Entertainment, marking the first time anime was sold in high-definition home media. At the start of 2012, 
Hanabi was founded to become a direct market rival to Mad Men. They licensed the list of powerful shows and have expanded each year since their inception. Shows now include Akamega Kill, Excel World, Anohana, Another, Batum, Fate Stay Night, Ilya and Unlimited Blade Works, Kids on the Slope, Lupin the Third, The Monogatari Series, No Game No Life, Parasite the Maxim, and Toradora, just to name a few. In 2014, they also launched an in-house encoding and authoring service, essentially allowing them to license shows directly from Japan and produce their own home media video releases in-house and also pioneer their own streaming service, which would later be scrapped. Universal and Sony made a joint partnership to enter the Australian anime market in 2013, initially re-releasing previously Mad Men licensed series Shakugan no Shana, Armitage III, Serial Experiments Lane and Hibernate Renmei, a trend they would continue with Black Lagoon, Ergo Proxy, Texonalize and Steam Boy. They've continued expanding up until the current year and their catalogue now includes new series such as A Certain Magical Index and Scientific Railgun, Bludgeoning Angel Dokuro-chan, Rage of Bahamut, Eden of Grissia, Heroic Legend Arslan, Tokyo Ravens, Seraph of the End and My Hero Academia. May 2014 marked the launch of Anime Lab, the successor to Mad Men's screening room. Taking advantage of their massive catalogue, 50 series and 700 episodes has grown to 260 series and over 6,000 episodes in less than 4 short years. At this time, foreign companies such as Crunchyroll had already entered the Australian market. In 2016, the first Australian anime dedicated convention was held in Melbourne as the Mad Men Anime Festival celebrating 20 years of Mad Men entertainment. The following year, Brisbane and Perth would be added as annual venues. And that brings us up to last year. Anime continues to air on Australian television, the Anime Lab streaming service was a highly successful marketing shift, and more films than ever are receiving theatrical releases. In 2017 alone, I saw over 40 anime films in cinema, both new and old, ranging from classics like Akira, Cowboy Bebop, Evangelion Rebuilds, new Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon films, to the new Sword Art Online movie, Black Butler, Fate Heaven's Feel, Fireworks, Genocidal Organ, Excel World, Erica 7, Mary and the Magic Flower, and my favourite movie of all time, A Silent Voice, all getting cinema releases by Mad Men. So that was it for this video guys, I hope I gave you some insight into the history of anime coming over to our small country in the west. I'd love to do more historical anime videos in the future. I have a really passionate insight into these things. So it was my pleasure to make this video and I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. That was some shit.